Who is Melody Lauer and why would a pregnant woman care about what she has to say? Next on uh, IFC Warrior Wednesday. Everybody, uh, Michael Ware with the Iowa Firearms Coalition, and we have a special guest here today, somebody who is local but takes care of local things and national. We've got uh, uh, Melody Lauer with Citizens Research, excuse me, Citizens Defense Research. Sorry, I almost messed that up right, or did That's mess okay. it up right out of the shoot. So Citizens uh, Defense Research. Tell us what that is, Melody, and why do we care? So Citizens Defense Research, we started that in about 2016, I believe, 2015, 2016. And really what we wanted to focus on was the fact that training, at least when I first came into it, the most that you could find training from was like law enforcement, military, that kind of stuff. And we really wanted to emphasize the regular citizens, the people who aren't in the military and will never be in the military or the people who aren't in law enforcement or will never be in the law enforcement and just your average person doing their nine to five and really focusing on training solutions that speak specifically to their particular needs. Okay. So people wouldn't have to go to a class and then try and like figure out where to fit the training. It's more just exactly geared to you, your average citizen and your daily life. Well, it hasn't been that long ago that I pondered something uh, that most people I don't think actually think about. And this isn't a swipe at organized uh, law enforcement, military agencies, anything like that. But I will tell you, I think the number was offered me and I did a little research and I found that the number wasn't quite right. It was very close. Uh, it was it was mentioned that there were about five million ish guns in law enforcement and military hands. And I found out that that number was a little light. It was a, a, a skosh more than that. So six and a half, maybe seven million. And then... <laughs> And then we're told uh, that the civilian population is somewhere between 400 and almost 500 million at this point. And so I'm asking myself, OK, uh, it would be logical to assume that there's a lot of people out there who would benefit from training. And it's always been the position uh, at IFC and mine personally, I share it. Uh, that I don't want any kind of tran uh, excuse me, uh, training mandated on the general public. I do not. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't find that constitutional. I don't find it wise. But I will tell you, I want to see people opt in to the best and highest level of training that they can withstand and afford. I think that that's a uh, that's a responsibility. That's an obligation. So it's almost as if uh, training gets in your blood after you try it and after you do you, uh, have some success with it and you feel emboldened to do more and learn and and uh, um, uh, chase that responsibility, if you will, to to an all new height. So have you seen that? Have you seen people uh, find themselves driven to you and then and then flower? Or how does this typically work when you find somebody that's new? Well, typically the people who start down this journey really are taking it seriously and they're really thinking about it at the micro level, okay. because as you know, as well as anybody in this training space, there are a lot of people who buy guns as talismans, not as actual useful devices. They they get the gun and they think magic presto, this is going to protect me from, from danger. But the people who really put thought into it and say, okay, now I have this thing. How do I actually use it? How do I know that I'm proficient with it? And how do I make sure that I don't have a negative outcome with it? Those are the people who frankly, are the best students because they're self-driven to learn. You and I both know that people who are mandated training often just go through the bare minimum to check the boxes and they don't really retain what it is that they learned. But the people who are serious about this, they start and you're right, they kind of get this like self-perpetuating momentum that keeps going yeah. because the goalposts continue to change because they realize, okay, I have the bare basics of, of competency, but now I've I've identified some weaknesses, some weak spots in my games that maybe I need to tweak a little bit or get a little bit of additional training on, excuse me. And that drives the next thing and that drives the next thing. So how that works for us is we've kind of set up our curriculum to be very, very um, 
I guess, open to that kind of learning. You know, we have our fundamentals pistols class that you can come in and get the bare minimum of what you need to use a firearm in any situation. And then we move right up to an intermediate where you can kind of expand your skills just a little bit. And then we have some forced decision-making classes where uh, that allows you to make decisions and even make negative decisions in a safe environment. And I think that is so crucial for anybody who's trying to learn because it's easy for us as trainers to set up where you're going to get all successes, right? I can set up a curriculum that allows you to see nothing but success, but you're not actually making decisions that are going to affect you potentially negatively. And when we start opening up the ability for people to make forced decisions and potentially make the wrong decision, we don't want that to be the first time that they do that to be for real. We want you to give you a safe environment where you can make a forced decision and potentially fail, but still learn and not have not go to jail yeah. or not be killed because of that decision. Then we go right up to our force on force class. We even have a revolver class. We have a mental agility and preparedness planning skills class. We of course have the armed parent class. And then we also have a personal protection for women class as well. So we try and cover all the bases for yeah. your average civ civilian. I, I like that. That's fantastic. These are the kinds of things that it, I, I really wanted to hear uh, from you or somebody because we're not, uh, we're not sitting down as a populace as as new firearms owners or or veteran firearms owners that are taking this to the next level. And I don't think that we're thinking through this clearly and as thoroughly as we should. And you're describing the scenarios that you're going to ask people or force them um, in, outside of their comfort zone so they think through this stuff. I think that that's a tremendous exercise mentally and physically. Um, Switching gears for just a moment, on full disclosure, I have known you and your husband for a long time. Uh, I've appreciated our conversations. We've done some business together. Yeah. I would like to know from you if you've seen any tremendous changes in your time. Are there shifts away from one thing into another? Are you seeing an all new demographic uh, with students? And if so, what do those things look like? So in your time training, which has been quite a while now, mm -hmm. what are you seeing? Are there trends? Are you moving one way or the other or what? Oh, yeah. I mean, so I've been doing this for 16 years and there have been lots of trends that have come and gone. Um, and one thing that I am seeing that I believe is definitely good for the industry overall is that I have seen a trend towards inclusiveness, not just of women, but also of minority groups. I've seen a lot more minority groups pop up, um, even LGBTQ plus groups that have started to get into firearms, even liberal gun owners, which I think is a fantastic thing. And um, my own company, we did a personal protection for sex workers class in Las Vegas uh, for legal sex workers, because we believe strongly that despite your politics, despite your your sexual orientation, despite anything, a self-defense is a human right. And we do not get involved in, and we do not opine on your politics. We don't opine on your the personal way that you live your life or what you choose legally to do within your own state. We're here to teach self-defense and we won't shame you for anything else. And I think that um, as more instructors learn that that that's the way of the future. You know, if we keep continue to be exclusive and make things only, you know, you have to be a conservative white person who is straight or whatever, um, you're going to one, exclude the people who are up and coming, and you're going to exclude the people who might actually need self-defense the most. And it's not us to be the gatekeepers of who should and should not learn self-defense. If they're here in our space asking us for help, it's kind of our moral duty as instructors to help them where they are and not to give our opinions on their personal life. There are rare occurrences uh, in full disclosure. I hold an FFL and I'm a dealer and a manufacturer. So um, in full disclosure, there have been almost no times, I think I can think of maybe a couple um, where I chose not to do business with somebody. It didn't have anything to do with, you know, if they have a, a terrible haircut or 
they were some political leaning or whatever. It had nothing to do with that. Uh, I believe by the way that they were acting and what they were saying and they were doing uh, that this wasn't any kind of thing that I wanted to participate with. And I'm sure maybe in trainers over time may find somebody someplace that they're like, no, this isn't for you. I'm not comfortable doing this. And you and I have an obligation, as you said, uh, morally and ethically uh, to say no when we know or we suspect something's up. Short of that, <laughs> civil rights are for everyone. I mean, uh, point to a person and I can show you a center, right? So yeah. yours are no bigger or smaller than mine. So I think that, that when, when you talk about um, inclusivity in the community or whatever else, we're seeing now that this isn't the uh, buy gummy, you know, the the 50 something or 60 something white guy club. Uh, we've moved past that. And I'm really tickled uh, to see all these different people considering these things for the first time, thinking through it and the community that's associated with that. So I'm hoping that most people are, are embracing everybody coming to these things uh, with open arms. It would be kind of a shame if they didn't. So uh, I, I guess that doesn't surprise me. Um, I do use you as an example a lot of times in my shop, Melody. I, I, I do. Uh, uh, I don't know if people could tell by the video, but you're not what I would consider a a large frame woman or something like <laughs> no. that, right? So there are women that come in here, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to conceal? I just don't think I could do it. And some of these women are very petite, you know, and they, they're they're just, you know, they're they're not very big and they don't have a lot of places to conceal. And they're like, well, I'll carry my purse. And I'm like, well... I don't actually say no to that, but I sure wish that you had it on your person. And I yeah. think that that's a much better way to go. And then I say, listen, I've got a friend, a customer that uh, is a very small, petite woman. And I assure you, there are people out there like her that can show you how you can carry on your person and do this well. And they're like, well, how would you do it? I'm like, well, I'm not as qualified to do that. <laughs> Something like she is. So she's going to be able to help you with it. There are places on Instagram, there are videos that you can, you can look through this and just get an idea. But uh, I mean, if you're going to wear a tank top and a pair of uh, uh, yoga pants everywhere you go, you're going to be limited no matter what size mm -hmm. you are. But if you can change just a few things here and there, women can easily conceal a well-chosen firearm. Would you like to talk about that for just a second or can we touch on that? Because I think there's a ton of women out there who are thinking about doing this melody, but I don't think they can envision what that actually looks like or what choices they may have. And maybe this will help somebody. Could you walk through that maybe? Sure. And I okay. think that that's another trend that I've definitely seen is that as um, as the industry has really expanded, not only its customer base, it has filled the gap for products to meet the needs of that customer base. And for when I first started out, the the go to response was, "Well, you're just going to have to change, you, you know, your attire. You're just going to have to change." And thank God there were enough women out there who said, "No, I don't want to change what I look like. I'm secure in what I look like. I want to wear what I want to wear. Make holsters and make products that fit for me." Mm -hmm. And thankfully, people like Fulster have really stepped up with products like the Enigma, which you were talking about wearing a yoga pants and a tank top. You literally can wear yoga pants and a tank top mm -hmm. with a smartly chosen firearm and conceal it perfectly well and be comfortable and be safe. That's the biggest one. For the longest time, there was a cacophony of just crappy options out there for women that people peddled on us and said, oh, look at this. It's made for women by women. So therefore it's cool. And it was just awful. They were unsafe. They were uncomfortable. They were hot. And then you had a company like Fulster step up and create the Enigma, which really uh, revolutionized carry for people of, of small stature, both men and women. Yeah. So I primarily carry in the Enigma these days, not all the time, but I'd say probably I'd say a good 60 to 70% of the time. And um, that really does open up skirts, yoga pants, um, anything that does not have a strong, sturdy waistband, but it still allows you to carry a firearm in that position, you know, whether you can do it strong side, if you would like to, or appendix, um, and you get really, really good customizable concealment with that. So it's pretty much for just kind of like a general one-stop solution without one, without going into, like you said, lifestyle dress choices and stuff like that. I pretty much rec recommend the Fulster uh, Enigma right off the bat. Sure. And then uh, Tessa Booth, 
who used to go by Armed and Styled on on um, Instagram. I yes. don't know. She changed her her handle, but she has an amazing video on basically how to choose the right gun for your body size. So if you are a very petite person, she actually goes through the measurements and has the correct ratio. So you can mathematically figure out, is this going to be more difficult for me to conceal or is this going to be easier for me to conceal? Now, that being said, it is still personal choice. So for instance, if you go by her math, the guns that I commonly carry are too big for me, but they're, but I have learned how to make them work for me. So I commonly carry a Glock 19 or actually it's a Glock 17 that the grip has been chopped down to a 19 size. So it's a little bit more concealable and that works for me a lot of the time, but there are times it doesn't work for me. And that's something that I think is the biggest thing that women and men really do need to understand is that when it comes to women and concealing firearms, you, you're not going to get a one, one stop shop option with maybe with an enigma, you'll get very close. You'll get very, very close, but there are going to be moments if she has a diverse wardrobe, like most women do, where she's wearing dresses and she's wearing skirts and she's wearing yoga pants. And she's, you know, she has all this different outfits there's going to be an outfit that she's not going to work with with her normal carry gun and probably nor normal carry position or carry holster. So she may either need to decide not to carry that day or carry in a different, you know, carry off body, which yeah. like you said, I don't recommend off body, but there are ways to do it safely. And if that's the option that you want to do, then talk to someone like myself or someone who has experience in carrying off body so that you can do it safely and responsibly. Yeah. I've I've had ladies say, well, that's fine, Michael, but uh, I plan on going to the pool or whatever else. And what am I going to do? And I'm like, well, when you're poolside, <laughs> your, your options uh, drop. Are very limited. Uh, so you're going to have to make some other choices. But oh, by the way, it, when you're not poolside, I really want you to have this weapon on your person, if at all possible. So I think that those are good things to talk about. And from somebody who knows how. Now, when we're talking about citizens defense research, how long has that been around? Like I said, it started in 2015. Now, um, I actually was Central Iowa Defense Training before that because I was kind of in Iowa specifically. But then once it got outside of the, the state of Iowa, that's when it um, expanded into citizens defense research. So um, that we started that in about 2015. So what is that now? Eight years going yeah. on eight years. So um, yeah, it's been here for a little while and we are planning. I We've expanded to now I have four instructors underneath of me. Um, you know, Chris Seifert, who's a former Green Beret, Caleb Giddings, he teaches our revolver stuff. He is a internationally known revolver shooter um, and, um, and uh, award winner in revolver shooting. We've got Ross Hick, who does amazing stuff with, with psychology of criminals. That's what he does on his daily job. And we also have Alex, um, Alex Clark, who is probably one of the best shooters from concealment in the country right now. So I've got an amazing, amazing team behind me and we are doing fantastic stuff and we would love to help anybody on their journey. Fantastic. I have in parting, I've got uh, one quick question. Um, I guess it's two, two things. Uh, so in the last eight years, let's say, and we're talking about um, in the reflection of citizens defense research, what was the most pleasing thing that you encountered and what was the least pleasing thing that you ran across in your time? I'm curious about those two. Ooh, as, as an instructor or just in general? Sure, or... whatever, however you choose to respond. I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's a very interesting question because, wow, there's a lot of different ways you could go with that. I think the most pleasing thing that I have encountered is like I said, maybe the inclusivity, the inclusivity and the, and I'm, I'm so blessed truly to have a team of people around me who share my values on that. Yeah. Um, there's not a single person that I have worked with in the last eight years who has been like, no, we're not going to, we're not going to teach those people. I think those people are lesser than, or who have made jokes about someone or any, any kind of derogatory uh, nature or exposure. And I've been very proud of my team for how, even despite their own feelings, they might have their own personal feelings about those things, yeah. but they would never, ever make those known to, to um, a student or exclude them because of their opinions. So I think that's probably the best thing that I've seen. Um, the worst thing that I have seen is probably what's funny is um, I say this 
quite frequently sometimes for an industry and a community that prides itself on teaching people how to deal with violent conflict, we're some of the worst in interpersonal conflict. So sometimes you'll get like the backbiting in the industry or the trying to tear each other down. And I am a really big believer that a rising tide, uh, you know, lifts all ships kind of a thing. I would much rather work with people towards a collective solution than try to, you know, talk behind someone's back or ruin someone's reputation. And whenever I see that, thankfully, it doesn't happen too much on the public stage, but sometimes it does. And it just hurts my soul because sometimes I just want to like grab two people by the ear and be like, hey, you two just sit down and talk this out, you know, Um, and I wish that there was a lot more focus and emphasis in our community on good communication skills, you know, um, respectful disagreement and the ability to have discourse, but still say, hey, you know what, we disagree on this, but I still respect you. And I think that you're a great instructor, or I think that you're a good person or whatever. And let's work together on this instead of working against each other. So that's my, those are my highs and lows. I think uh, I'm glad to hear both of those. That's interesting to hear you frame them that way. Uh, (laughs) I've got to tell you, Melody, this is the one, two, I'm recording this at uh, what three o'clock in the afternoon ish. Mm -hmm. This is the third time today that uh, the idea of building the tallest building in town uh, has two paths and two paths alone. You can swing a wrecking ball from the top of your building and knock everybody else's down and give yours the artificial appearance of being tall, Mm -hmm. or you can work your butt off and add floors yourself, but there's almost no other way to do it. So are you going to do this, this work? with integrity and character or are you going as you said backbite or tear somebody else down uh gosh that happens a lot i'm with you in that um think where we could be if we weren't busy you know cat fighting and clawing mm-hmm. and scratching so i think that that's a fantastic perspective and a uh a look back over your time because i uh i happen to share it i really right. i really think you're onto something there okay so uh citizens defense research Tell us how we can see you. Tell us how we can get in touch with how people that are reaching out for training their their 15th class or their first. How do they get a hold of you guys? Citizensdefenseresearch.com is our website. We're really active on Facebook and uh, we do have an Instagram, which is also citizensdefenseresearch.com or I'm sorry, at citizensdefenseresearch, sorry. And then we do have a a Twitter, which is uh, CDR, I believe CDR instructors. We're not as active on Twitter as we are on Facebook and on um, just our website there. But all of our classes that are currently going are all listed on Eventbrite. You can find them through our website or you can just go to Eventbrite. It's actually, this is what's weird about Eventbrite. You can, you'll actually get there faster if you just Google Citizens Defense Research Eventbrite. It will actually take you to our page. But if you go to Eventbrite, it's hard to find us. So, um, it, but either way or that, or go to our website and that'll direct you there as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the time today. I hope that the IFC members and everybody watching uh, um, absorbed some of this so they can, uh, they can ponder training and what it takes. I, uh, I have people through here all the time that are asking about these things for the first time and they're afraid because they don't know. So there are people out there, Melody and her group at uh, uh, Citizens Research Defense. These folks are going to be able, uh, wait a minute, Citizens Defense Research. Yes, I don't know why. I could say that a few more times in this video, Citizens Defense Research, and make sure that I bring it home too. You can so, just say CDR too, that works. Okay, all right. But but, but I, I hope that people are watching and, and they're pondering because there are people out there that are qualified, Melody and her group, among many others, that can say, uh, I can help you. There are things you don't know, but I know that you want to know. So be mm-hmm. honest with us. Uh, uh, bring your best intentions and we'll, and we'll help you. I, and we'd my, be happy to help you. Oh yes. And in, in my time being in and around this, I've never seen anybody at any training course ever. Some people it's rare. Some people do find that this may not be for them, but overwhelming the majority, 99% at least, um, leave saying I am far more confident than I was before. This was a great use of my time. So, uh, hopefully we can help some people. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael. This was this was fantastic and a good discussion. Uh, Iowa Firearms Coalition, reach out to us and we'll help you if we can. Thank you.